In my childhood home lived my grandmother. In all the time I knew her, she lived in a bed. She was very old and had long white hair. And she would call me into her room, draw me close and say to me, give me a kiss and I'll give you a silver mint. I must confess the five-year-old me didn't really like being kissed, at least not by a very old lady with long white hair. But I did like silver mints, which was the most popular brand of white mint sweet. Ever since that time, mint sweets have made, for me, have become associated with kisses and dying. Over a period of months, I sucked my grandmother's packets of mints. But in March 1969, my supply of mints dried up. That was when my grandmother died. She died at home in her own bed. And so that was my childhood experience of dying, that people died at home, cared for by their loved ones. Over the decades of my life, the tradition of the sick and the elderly dying at home became increasingly uncommon. I knew that it wasn't always possible or suitable or even what some of the dying themselves wished for. But it wasn't a subject I thought much about until one day my partner turned to me and said, when I die, I'd like to die at home. A few years after that conversation, our lives changed when my partner Mervyn, he became terminally ill. Later, there was a particular day. It was the 31st of July, 2013. Mervyn had been admitted to an institution for end of life care. I'm at his bedside. I've been told that he's only a couple of days to live. Mervyn drifts in and out of consciousness. I keep vigil, interrupting the long hours by every so often placing a gentle kiss on his sweaty forehead and sucking my way through packets of mints. In one of his conscious moments, Mervyn whispers in my ear, I wish to die at home. I already knew this. Ever since he had been admitted to the institution, I'd been trying to impress on the staff that Mervyn wished to die at home. Eventually, they understood. I step out of the room and again ask the nurse about it. The nurse replies, the ambulance is booked for this afternoon between 2 and 5 p.m. Returning to Mervyn's bed, I say to him, you'll be home soon. We wait for the ambulance. Mervyn stretched out on the bed, me by his side. I tell him, not long now. By half past four, the ambulance has not arrived. I inquire at the nurse's desk. And again at five o'clock, the planned discharge time has now passed. A nurse phones the ambulance service. An estimated time of arrival cannot be provided. At half past six, stepping out of Mervyn's room, I inform a doctor of our situation. He replies that this is not his responsibility. By seven o'clock, I tell a nurse that there's a danger that Mervyn might die there in the institution, rather than in his own home, contrary to his wish. At a quarter past eight, a nurse informs me that the ambulance has arrived. Mervyn is very weak. The nurse injects him with more morphine to ease the pain. The nurse, the ambulance driver, his colleague and I, the four of us, we use a handheld stretcher to move Mervyn from the bed to a trolley. 
Then we wheel him slowly down the long gray corridor through the wide glass doors of the main exit and into the ambulance. The ambulance drives very slowly towards our home on the outskirts of Belfast. By half past nine, the ambulance arrives at our house and parks on the public footpath. I tell Mervyn that we are outside our house, our home from which I am now speaking to you. The ambulance men tell me that they cannot proceed. We will have to wait in the back of the ambulance for however long it takes until two additional ambulance crew can be sourced as they are needed to carry Mervyn on a stretcher. In the meantime, my friend Terry arrives to be with me. It's warm in the back of the ambulance and Mervyn indicates to me to open the ambulance door. The summer evening's gentle breeze sweeps through the back of the ambulance. The minutes pass. I'm worried that Mervyn might die there outside our house in the back of an ambulance. Mervyn gestures that he needs to urinate. Taking a plastic urine container, I press it against his lower naked body. We wait for the trickle. While outside on the footpath, under the streetlight, Terry uses an umbrella to shield Mervyn from public view. By a quarter past 10, a second ambulance crew arrives. The now four person ambulance crew carry Mervyn on a stretcher from the ambulance through the front door of this house, down the corridor and into our bedroom. They carefully lay Mervyn on the bed. He is still alive. 44 hours later, Mervyn died peacefully. He achieved his wish to die at home. Thank you so much, Richard. What a beautiful, moving and tender story. We were with you seeing the summer evening and the countdown of those hours. I must have been um, distressing to keep on having to remind people about the ambulance going home. It was distressing, but um, it's strange that um, because of COVID, we're telling yeah. the stories from home. So I'm actually able yeah. to tell the story from the uh -huh. house where that uh, happened. And, uh, yeah. and it's also something that, uh, you know, was actually a positive experience for me in the end because uh, of which, course. Uh, which, uh, which was uh, uh, was well, well, well fulfilled. Yeah. And the I, night can, of low, I can I, hear Mervyn's voice saying, I not I want to go home or take me home, but the particularity, I wish to die at home. <laughs> I can hear him say that. Yeah, no, yeah, he had, you know, a very definite uh, preference and I was able to fulfill it. Yeah. Um, but just saying wish, you know, rather than want, he, he had such a lovely way with language. Thanks, because I, I, I know you actually remember him and that's, uh, that's, that's yeah. nice to meet uh, uh, here too. Thank you.